In this next video, I'm going to explain the idea of Condorcet voting um, and show an important limitation of that sort of voting. So, remember, all our voting procedures start with a collection of individual preferences over the available options. And what we want is to have output from that, ideally a ranking, if we're looking for a social welfare function, or a winner of the election, if we're just looking for a collective choice rule. The Condorcet procedure, let's, let's give some individual preferences here. So I'm going to have three options, A, B, and C. We have A, B, C, that's one voter's preferences. A is preferred over B, B over C, and therefore by transitivity, A over C. A second voter says A beats C beats B. And a third voter thinks that uh, A beats B beats C. In order to determine the Condorcet ranking, we consider every single possible pair. Now, what are the possible pairs? A and B, B and C, and A and C. That's all the three ways you can form pairs between the three options. And with regard to each pair, you go through and you add up the preferences people hold over those pairs and look at what order they go in. So A is preferred over B by the first voter. A is also preferred over B by the second voter. It's not a direct and immediate one because we infer it by transitivity the way I've drawn it here, but that clearly means A is preferred over B. And the third person, A is preferred over B. So in fact, it's unanimous, not merely a majority. And if you ever have a majority preferring one over the other, you put in the social ranking. So this is our, our Condorcet ranking, we could call it. A comes out over B. What about B and C? Well, it's going to be B is preferred over C here. Here it goes the other direction. C is preferred to B. And in third voter, B is preferred over C. Well, again then, a majority think B is preferable to C, so B is put in as over C. And then finally, to finish off, we have to look at A and C. And A is preferred over C. A is preferred over C. A is preferred over C. Again, it's unanimous. And then you could try to write this out as an overall ranking. And it's reasonably straightforward. It looks like A beats every other option. A beats B and C. And so it's what we call the Condorcet winner. It comes first. Then, um, which should come second? Should it be B or should it be C? Well, of B or C, which one comes uh, uh, wins in the Condorcet ranking? B does. So it's A beats B beats C. That's Condorcet voting. It's very intuitive, and it's when it works, it gives very plausible results. The problem is, you cannot be guaranteed of having a winner. That is, remember, a winner is an option that beats all others. So it has to, when you look at the individual pairs, it has to win every pairing in which it's involved. Okay. How might this work? Well, the standard sort of setup is very easy to do. It's A, B, C for voter 1. Voter 2 thinks B is best, then C, then A. And voter 3 thinks C is best, then A, and then B. So how do we fare? First, we compare A and B. Well. There is one person prefers A over B. This person prefers B over A. Ah, but the majority, because the third person says A over B, the majority says A is ranked better than B. So this will be in our, our social ranking, whereas these are the individual rankings. Now, 
Uh, what about B versus C? Well, one person ranks B over C, two people rank B over C. That's already enough for us to know we've got a majority. We don't even need to check the third. So B is ranked over C. And finally, what about uh, A and C? Well, one person ranks A over C, but one ranks C over A, two ranks C over A, so C is ranked over A. So, is there one option that beats all others? A beats B, so it's a candidate. We now have to check how does A fare against C? Ah, unfortunately, A is beaten by C. So A is not a Condorcet winner. Okay, what about B? B beats C, so it also is a candidate, but hang on, we've already noticed A was beaten by B, so no, it can't possibly be a Condorcet winner. So neither A is nor B. What about C? Well, C looks like a candidate when you notice that it beats A, but no, C is beaten by B. So there is no Condorcet winner, and this is what's known as the Condorcet paradox, that you can have a set of uh, preferences like this, which are all individually rational. They all rank the, uh, the options in a perfectly rational way. They respect transitivity. There's no cycles. And yet, collectively, nothing comes out as top. In fact, there isn't a collective ranking. If you try to represent this in an ordering, you'll fail because you might put A at the top at first and then put B below it and then put C below that. And we'll draw in arrows here to sort of indicate the direction of ranking. But then, this now misleadingly implies that A is better than C, but it's not. We know that according to the Condorcet procedure, C beats A. So you would really need a third arrow to come back around like this. Hence, it's a cyclic arrangement in the social uh, ranking, you might call it, even though it's, that effectively means it's not a ranking. There isn't a best option. Now, obviously, in the real world, we don't put up with that. Okay? We don't off have an election and then say, Oh, guess what? There's no winner. People are very concerned when they have real elections to make sure that there is, in fact, every time, a genuine winner. So, one obvious conclusion is, in the real world, we tend not to use Condorcet voting because there's too much of a risk of it not leading to a definite outcome. And note, sometimes we get in real world elections ties whereby the vote seems to be sort of drawn perfectly between two sides. That's not the same problem as this. That would be saying, really, you could toss a coin. Either one is equally preferred at the social level. But in this case, our, none, none of our options is equally best preferred with any other one. Nothing is best preferred because everything else, every option, there's another thing that is preferred over it. So in the real world, what we have are options that real voting procedures, no, maybe not always, but often guarantee a winner. Uh, you might like to think about how we guarantee a winner in something like the electoral system for the House of Representatives in Australia. The issue is, is it safe to change what looked like an attractive, plausible way to start, the Condorcet process, and tweak it in a way to come up with some real voting procedure that guarantees a winner? Is that going to have some drawbacks that come along for the ride? Now, you can study individual methods, and you can note drawbacks of individual methods, but in order to reach a general conclusion, this is where we like to use the mathematical power of something like social choice theory to generalize about what's going to be good or bad about a whole class of voting procedures. And so one of the key things that Kenneth Arrow did in his famous proof is he assumes that the voting procedure will never lead to the Condorcet paradox. Right? It will never lead to a case where we don't get a, a ranking of the options. You will always get a definite ranking. So that means when he faces the, the Condorcet paradoxical sort of preferences, which just to remind you is something like this, 
he must be using some method to break a tie. Just to give you a sense of what sorts of methods might be used, well, there's one called the border count, right? Where instead of just asking people their pairwise preferences, you ask them to assign numbers to things. So it might be that we have option A here, B here, C here, and we have voters, and this voter could say, I'll give this one one, this two, and this three. This person might say, I'll give this two, this one, and this three. This one says, I'll give this one two, this one one, oh, no, this one three, this one one. And the method then is you add these numbers and whichever one comes out with the lowest number is the winner. So the, the sum here is five, two plus three plus one is six, three plus one plus three is seven. So it turns out the lowest thing in this uh, ordering is A, and so it can come out with as, as first in the, the border count. So it's spelled B-O-R-D-A. Uh, there are other methods you could use. You could say to people, look, you don't have to assign numbers one, two, three. We're going to give you 100 points, and you can distribute the points however you like. So you might distribute 100 to this, and zero to that, and zero to that. Uh, or you could say indicate your sort of indifference between a couple of options and you're not much liking the third by by going um, 50 50 zero or you could show what a close call it is for you by voting uh, 60 that's not going to work out uh, let's make it 40. 31, 29. That would be somebody who finds it very hard to separate the options, but narrowly prefers A. Uh, all of these methods will avoid the problem of the Condorcet paradoxical preferences. If, for instance, you put in uh, just the straight analog of the Condorcet paradox case, whereby it would be 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, 3, 1, 2 are our preferences. Let's just put that in. One, two, three, two, three, one, three, one, two. Well, it's not an entirely satisfying result. It turns out that the border count is tied. All of them get precisely six. But at least this is now a principled rule which says they're tied. It's not a rule that says, a la the previous Condorcet procedure, that there is no best. Um, so when Arrow is going to present his proof about the power of social choice methods and their limitations, he's assuming that, like the border method, they're always going to manage to impose some sensible ordering on things, even if it's the slightly frustrating, they're tied type of method. That will do for Condorcet voting. In the next major video, we're going to go on to Arrow's actual strategy for how he develops his proof.